Welcome everyone for uh, your attendance uh, at this, uh, what promises to be a lively lecture in response. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Mark Massa first, and then uh, when he finishes, I'll introduce the two respondents. And the fact that there are two respondents to uh, Father Massa's lectures does not indicate that his quality of his material is so suspect that it needs to be corrected. <laughs> it's just that it's so interesting that it invites response. <laughs> Uh, Mark Masser is a Jesuit, and he is an alumnus of Western Jesuit School of Theology. Uh, he earned his MDiv there, and then he went not far away from the school to uh, earn his THD at uh, Harvard University Divinity School. He is, uh, he is the author of many articles, as well as six books. And I'll just mention a couple of those books. Uh, Catholics and American Culture was the winner of the Alpha Sigma Nu Best Work in Theology in 1999-2000. Two, and anti-Catholicism in America. Both titles, uh, incidentally, are available for purchase uh, on the uh, on the side. For the past decade, his research has focused on uh, the Catholic experience in the United States since World War II. Catholics in American culture sought to provide a non-master narrative approach to understanding how Catholics. Uh, left their secure ghetto after 1945 to enter middle-class affluence with somewhat mixed results. Anti-Catholicism in American culture in America explains how and why Catholics and other Americans actually do see the world differently, a difference that has contributed significantly to prejudgment about Catholics in the United States. In spring 2008, he published a history of Catholic theology in the United States since the Second Vatican Council entitled American Catholic History, a Documentary Reader. He is the Karl Rahner Distinguished Professor of Theology and co-director of the Curran Center for American Catholic Studies at Fordham University. He is a very popular guest lecturer and teacher, and in 1994 he was presented with the inaugural award for Best Teacher in the Humanities at Fordham. This year, Mark Masser is serving as the Gasson Professor of Theology in the Theology Department at Boston College. Tonight he will be speaking on a more evangelical Catholicism, question mark. Mark. Thank you, and thank you all for coming. The oldest joke in the Fordham Theology Department's doctoral program goes something like this. What do you have when you cross Tony Soprano and a Catholic Studies scholar? And the answer, of course, is someone who makes you an offer you can't understand. But I would like to make you an offer that you can understand about making Catholicism in the United States more attractive to people looking for spiritual answers, more accountable to the 64 million Catholics who live in this country, and more mature in its purpose on our rich, but sometimes shallow, public culture. In making you this offer this afternoon, I'd like to begin by making three claims here at the beginning of my talk, and I'd like to expand on these three claims a bit, and then, always the most interesting part of an event like this, I'd like to engage the questions that you might have that will arise. My hope for the end of this event is the, de the Jesuit definition of a good liturgy, which is that no one gets hurt and everyone emerges with their dignity intact, something that doesn't always happen at Jesuit presided sacraments, but hopefully will happen this afternoon. My three assertions are these. First, in terms of institutional religion's relationship with the state, my, fir my first assertion is simply the wall of separation between church and state can never be high enough. The wall of separation can never be high enough. My second assertion is this. Historically, because of that wall of separation, the two most effective models for religion's success in the United States have been for religious groups to espouse either total culture or evangelical outreach. Again, so the two models there are total culture and evangelical outreach. And thirdly, the most effective strategy for the Catholic community in the United States in the 21st century is to become more evangelical. First, the wall of separation between church and state can never be high enough. Alex, Alexis de Tocqueville, the famous French visitor to the young United States in the 1830s, predicted that religion, and especially Catholicism, which was then a very small percentage of the American people, about 4% of the population, de Tocqueville predicted that Catholicism would thrive in the United States precisely because religion was totally free of state support and control. De Tocqueville's prediction, offered over a century and a half ago, has proven to be exactly correct. 
The United States has by far the highest church attendance rates and the most impressive network of religiously inspired voluntary associations of any industrialized nation in the world. Compared to nations where religion has some official tie with the state, countries for instance, like England, Scotland, Sweden, or until recently, the Republic of Ireland, where one would intuitively expect greater religious commitment because of government support and subsidies, the facts are rather counterintuitively dramatic. Compared to, say, England, the United Kingdom, where 6% of the members of the Church of England are in church on Sunday, according to the 2000 poll, or Sweden, where 4% of the 98% of the population nominally belonging to the Lutheran Church of Sweden attend church. The latest Gallup poll in the United States claims that 41% of Americans attended church, synagogue, or mosque within the last three weeks. That percentage, that statistic, 41%, now beats even Poland and Ireland in terms of regular church activity and piety. You might want to check out these statistics for yourself. Sociologists Roger Finke and Rodney Stark have written an engaging and very accessible statistical study of religion in the United States from 1776 to 2005. And their book, which is entitled The Churching of America, is very helpful. Uh, referring to numbers, my own grasp of numbers, I always quote John Courtney Murray to my students. I say that numbers come to me easily, just not reliably. But Finke and Stark offer you numbers that are both easy to understand and very reliable. And their, ma their book makes for engaging reading. Finke and Stark argue, convincingly I think, that within the United States religious landscape, those religious groups which make high demands upon their inheritance in terms of time, energy, and financial support, which offer clear ethical guidelines, sometimes in tension with the culture, which offer a distinct religious identity, and which rely least on state support for their programs, outreach efforts, and educational programs, tend to be the winners in terms of numbers of adherents. On the other hand, those religious groups closely identified with the mainstream culture itse itself, for instance, groups like the Congregationalists, the Presbyterians, and the Episcopalians, all of whom at one time enjoyed establishment status in colonial America, and today, even today, enjoy quasi-establishment status in terms of per capita congregational wealth and representation in bodies like the US Senate hemorrhaged numbers in the 20th century. The example I always give my students is Episcopalians make up 1.7% of the US population and 28% of the US Senate. So what, wildly out of comparison to their absolute numbers, they wield what we might term cultural influence here. Religious groups like the Episcopalians and Presbyterians, once part of a group called the Seven Sisters, those seven mainline churches, which functioned as something like a semi-official religious establishment in this country, have consistently lost numbers in every religious census of the past six decades. We now find ourselves in a state of affairs where there are more Baptists than Congregationalists, Episcopalians, Unitarians, and Presbyterians combined. The key to all this rather counterintuitive news is something that we, in my trade of American religion called the voluntary principle. The voluntary principle was first described by de Tocqueville again in the early 19th century, and it goes something like this. The genius of the religious system in the United States is that the state makes all religion voluntary. That is, for religious groups to survive and grow, they must be better than their competitors in meeting the demands of potential numbers who must, vol excuse me, of their potential members who must voluntarily support and join them. In other words, according to de Tocqueville's century and a half old insight, religion flourished and flourishes in the United States because it is completely voluntary and all religious groups must compete. Voluntarism and competition, in other words, are very good for religion here and have made the United States the most religiously observant nation of the industrialized world. The higher the wall that keeps government and public groups out of religious concerns, the better.
Those who argue for closer institutional alliance between religious groups and the political institutions of the United States, I would argue, have it exactly wrong. The wall of separation can never be high enough. My second assertion, building on this first point about voluntarism and the separation of church and state. Because of the need for religious groups to compete for voluntary membership, the two most effective models for success in the United States since 1776 have been either total culture or evangelical outreach. These two models have proven to be the most effective in the American religious landscape because both of them play into the dynamics of competition, but in very different ways. Total culture is a form of religious identity that meets individuals' needs for, group, for social location, family values, and meaningful group interaction by providing a nourishing and complex, if sometimes confining, network of institutions for cradle, from cradle to grave. And this network of institution aims to provide a total identity for its adherents, a theological identity, a cultural identity, and sometimes even a political identity. And the example I always use is the very close identification of American Catholics with the Democratic Party until the, the Reagan revolution of the 1980s. Evangelical outreach, on the other hand, has won in the numbers sweepstakes by providing a warm individual piety, an intense cultural ideology to the single largest group of US citizens, about 40%. About 40% of US citizens claim to have been born again. So in my field, we say the single largest group of the religiously observant are evangelicals. Evangelical outreach has provided its ideology to support and help to grow the single largest group of religiously observant adults in the United States, those who have had a born again experience. The evangelical outreach model has achieved extraordinary success, not primarily through its institutional support networks, like the total cultural system, but rather through a highly effective appeal to individuals, and through those individuals, to the families and friends of them. Indeed, for a religious style highly distrustful of popular culture and the media, the evangelical tradition has by far the slickest and most successful media productions aimed at religiously curious people of any religious group in the United States. Far slicker, for instance, than Mother Angelica's Eternal Word television network. These two vastly different models, total culture on the one hand, evangelical outreach on the other, have been extraordinarily successful in attracting and retaining adherents in the United States during the past two and a half centuries. But they accomplished this from very different starting points, and they organized their adherents in very different ways. Until the 1960s, Roman Catholics in the United States opted quite successfully for the first model, the model that I'm calling total culture. That is, American Catholics constructed what historian Charles Morris has recently termed a Catholic mini-state, a total culture that formed and served its adherents from cradle to grave. The American Catholic world between 1800 and 1960 was a total experience, not unlike being Amish in Pennsylvania or Mormon in Utah, but stretching from coast to coast. As Gary Wills described it in his semi-bittersweet memories of a Catholic boyhood, and I quote from Wills here, we spoke a different language from the rest of America, not only the actual Latin we learned to serve mass as altar boys, we also had odd bits of Latinized English that were not part of other six-year-olds' vocabulary. Words like contrition and transubstantiation. The words often came embedded in formulae, perfect contrition versus imperfect contrition, and in distinctions, mortal sin and venial sin, matter of sin and intention of sin. To know the terms was to know the thing, to solve the problem, and so we learned and used a vast terminology, thus far wills. This language really supplied the cat what, what some scholars call Catholic speak of the total culture, where being the neighborhood, the atheist means that there was no God and Mary was his mother. All of this changed dramatically, of course, and changed in all kinds of ways in the years after World War II. 
Many contemporary critics of the breakup of this total culture blame the so-called liberalizing effects of the Second Vatican Council, or the massive non-compliance to the teaching about birth control promulgated in 1968 in Pope Paul VI's encyclical Humanae Vitae. But in fact, the process of breaking up the American Catholic ghetto was well underway considerably before 1963, the year in which the Second Vatican Council began meeting. Indeed, my historical studies lead me to believe that the total Catholic mini-state began falling apart for good and for ill during the middle two decades of the 20th century. Precisely as Catholics entered into the verdant pastures of middle-class affluence, thanks to the GI Bill of Rights, which allowed Catholic lambs to eat ivy at places like Yale and Columbia, and the cultural sense of arrival in 1960 with the election of John Fitzgerald Kennedy. I would argue that it was in the years between 1945 and 1965 that witnessed the beginning of the breakup of that far-flung network of institutions which had been so painstakingly constructed during the 19th and early 20th centuries. This breakup then wasn't only the result of outside forces. It also resulted from impulses emerging from within the American Catholic community itself. A, a significant portion of the American Catholic community heartily embraced what one scholar has termed the suburban captivity of the church, quite consciously and happily, leaving behind the nurturing but confining subculture in which poetry meant Leonard Feeney and college excellence was defined by Holy Cross. It was at the end of these two decades when Irish Catholics per capita emerged to become, as they are today, the wealthiest and best educated non-Jewish ethnic group in the United States, ranking just after American Jews and just above white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. Far from seeking to remain within the walls of their ghetto, Irish Catholics, quickly followed by German and Italian Catholics, embraced the liberal mainstream of post-World War II America with a fervor and a devotion which were, in retrospect, far too uncritical and far too celebratory of American culture for the long-term health of their religious community. The American Catholic mainstream then, in the decades after World War II, quite consciously abandoned the total cultural world of the Catholic ghetto. This leaving of the ghetto, I would argue, was culturally necessary, and indeed, it was culturally appropriate. Further, it was statistically predictable, if you consider it from the experience of other religious groups in the United States, that also had once stood apart from the mainstream. Groups like the Society of Friends or the Quakers, the Methodists and the Lutherans. Further, in terms of the Catholic community's obligations of taking responsibility for their culture, this move was an excellent religious and moral choice. But in terms of the Catholic community's theological identity as a community of faith, this abandonment of the Catholic mini-state has left American Catholicism in a kind of identity crisis, which afflicted the mainstream Protestant communities a century ago, at the beginning of the 20th century. For those of you who know your history, that was the period when adjectives like liberal and conservative, progressive and traditionalist began appearing before nouns like Presbyterian, Methodist, and Congregationalist. Does this sound familiar at all? The downside of the Catholic community's choice for leaving the co total cultural world of pre-World War II could perhaps best be illustrated by comparing the contemporary status of Roman Catholicism with a co religious community which has decided to remain within the to total cultural world, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, more commonly known to us as the Mormons. The Mormons today are one of the three fastest growing religious groups in the United States. And uh, an arresting example of their success, of the success of their model of total culture, is their singular tradition of sending their 19-year-old males and their 21-year-old females on mission, both in the United States and abroad. It would seem that something in the experience of their first two decades leads a very high percentage of young adult Mormons to volunteer for missionary work. And I would like to pause here for just a minute to consider that successful tradition among the Mormons. The Mormons, as most of you know, ask each of their young believers to take two years during their college experience to undertake what they call witnessing to the faith to the Gentiles. 
And somewhere just below 40% of young adult believers among the Mormons do this work, an impressively high percentage for those of you who know your standard mean deviations. It can reasonably be argued, I think, that some element of their family and or cultural experience in the Mormon mini-state leads a high percentage of their young people, almost half by their reckoning, to interrupt their educational careers to work for the church. Further, witnessing to their faith presumably means that they can articulate the most important points of their faith to non-Mormon, to whom they are sent on mission. All of this stands in marked contrast to the current debates within the American Catholic community about how effective we have been in passing on the faith to our young people. These, are, these debates are fraught with emotion, as those of you with teenagers know. And the statistics on our success are much controverted, but there has been a widespread sense among American Catholics that something has gone wrong in passing on religious literacy to our young people. For those of you interested in this question, you might want to take a look at a stu study published four years ago by a sociologist of religion teaching at the University of Notre Dame. His name is Christian Smith, who wrote a book called Soul Searching, The Religious and Spiritual Lives of American Teenagers. Smith utilized several national studies of young people as well as sending out his own questionnaire to thousands of American teenagers. His findings, as reported in his book, are mixed. Good news for Mormons and evangelicals, disquieting for Catholics, or at least I found them disquieting. Smith argues that the Catholic community of the United States runs more institutions directed at passing on its faith to young people than all the other religious groups combined. And yet Catholic young people are the least likely to be able to articulate either their own faith or that of their church. Indeed, he uses the phrase, incredibly inarticulate to describe Catholic teenagers. He says, Catholic young people are incredibly inarticulate in understanding their faith. Smith further argues that the American Catholic young people make up the largest single source for the real faith of American, te of American teenagers. And he calls that real faith of American teenagers moralistic therapeutic deism. Moralistic therapeutic deism, he contends, has a five-point creed. First, God is nice. Second, most people are nice. The behavior mandated by being nice being summarized by one 16-year-old boy he quotes as not being an asshole. Third, most people, save for Adolf Hitler and Stalin, go to heaven. Fourth, all other theological and ethical statements are relative, being true primarily if they work for you. And fifthly, and most importantly, whatever. <laughs> There are, I contend, some problems with the methodology of Smith's book, but the faith he describes so saliently comes very close to defining the faith expressed by my own smart undergraduates in Fordham College, a faith I find deeply disquieting. How is it that Mormon teenagers are so willing to volunteer for missionary work and so willing to express their faith fairly articulately? At least I've found it to be fairly articulate. There's, a, there's two young men who always stand outside the Third Avenue gate at Fordham, and I always engage them in conversation because they, they look kind of forlorn. You know, They seem pretty articulate about what the Mormon tradition believes. While Catholic young people, adherents of a faith which has been in the business of passing on its faith, exponentially longer than the followers of Joseph Smith are so incredibly inarticulate in doing so. Does the culture these young people grow up in have something to do with it? I find it very hard to believe that the background culture has little or nothing to do with it. On the contrary, I can't help but believe that it has a great deal to do with it. It seems unlikely to me, highly unlikely, that the American Catholic community will ever opt for returning to a ghetto a nurturing one or any other kind for that matter, nor should they. They left that confining ghetto in the middle of the 20th century because they had outgrown it. And as Thomas Smith, excuse me, as Thomas Wolfe has pointed out, you can't go home again in any case. Which brings me to my third and last assertion. The most effective strategy for the Catholic community in the United States in the 21st century is to become more evangelical. Now, I know that the phrases evangelical and born again have negative connotations in enlightened communities like Boston. And I know that people born in Boston have no desire to be born again anywhere else under any other circumstances. 
But let me explain what I mean by those terms before you dismiss it out of hand. I use the word evangelical in its formal etymological sense here. As the Dictionary of Christianity in America puts it, and this is their definition, quote, evangelicalism in the American context is characterized by a stress on the personal experience of the grace of God, usually turned, termed the new birth or conversion. Evangelicalism tends to emphasize a personal ability to verbalize religious faith and to accentuate the need to spread that faith to others, end quote. This may seem to you as a thoroughly Protestant form of Christianity, and in terms of most of the history of Christianity in North America, it has been a predominantly Protestant form of religious faith. But we should be careful in equating Protestant with evangelical without remainder. My own religious community, the Society of Jesus, or Jesuits, founded by St. Ignatius Loyola in the 16th century, is a resolutely evangelical order with a profoundly evangelical spirituality. Let me explain this. The very heart of Jesuit spirituality is a retreat outline known as the spiritual exercises. The purpose of those exercises, which were performed in their entirety twice in a Jesuit's lifetime for 30 days in silence, the purpose of them is called conversion of heart. This outcome, conversion of heart, is presented quite overtly as the goal of the spiritual exercises. And indeed, the person making the 30-day retreat is told explicitly to pray for this outcome, known in Jesuit parlance as praying for the fruit of the exercises. Jesuit spirituality, much like the spirituality of many other religious orders and of many other spiritual exercises like the Kairos and Teens Encounter Christ retreats given to high school and college students, is explicitly evangelical in the sense that they aim at an individual experience of grace in the context of which a life choice is made, or at least a life choice is presented as something basic to the Christian life. The, ind the individual who has successfully experienced the fruit of the exercises, or who has experienced the full force, let's say, of a Kairos retreat, can verbalize a religious encounter that is intensely personal and can also verbalize the kinds of choices that she or he made as a result of that encounter. I personally believe that this kind of personal religious experience, or even dare I use the word conversion experience, toward which both the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius and the Kairos retreats aim, is the kind of spirituality which should be made available to American Catholics individually. Let me go further than that. I believe that this kind of personal evangelical spirituality should become normative in the North American Catholic community. What this means, I think, is that the older Catholic model organized around a sacramental parochial model of worship, which emphasized the communal, mediated, and sacramental nature of Catholic Christianity, needs to now be balanced by complementary emphases on individual and unmediated or direct experience of the holy. What would this balancing of the sacramental on the one hand and the evangelical on the other, the communal and the personal, what would this achieve for the Catholic community? I think it would achieve a number of things, but let me name four for you. First, and most importantly, Christianity as a religion is at least as much about experience as it is about belief, or to be more ex exact, Experience and belief are so inextricably combined in Christianity that is unique among world religions. As I always tell my freshmen when I teach the Dick and Jane Meet God course, sitting at mass on Sunday morning doesn't make you a Christian any more than sitting in a garage makes you a car. Our life as Catholic Christians isn't only, indeed I would say our Catholic Christians isn't even primarily about encountering Jesus in the Eucharist. Our life as Catholic Christians is primarily about living as disciples of the Lord Jesus and being able to witness to that life of discipleship. That is a long-winded way of saying being a Catholic Christian is at least as much about the experience of Jesus as it is about the liturgical and doctrinal formulations about him. Christianity is about an experience that every Christian should be able to verbalize. 
all of us should be able to say, this is why I am a follower of the Lord Jesus and thus worship with other Catholic Christians at the Eucharist. I'm pretty sure that most American Catholics would have a hard time verbalizing their reasons for that, and I don't blame them at all. This is not their fault. After the Reformation, Catholic Christianity opted for a much more communal, hierarchical, and sacramental model of Christianity over against the re very real threats on the Protestant attack on sacramental realities. These decisions at the Council of Trent thus came to define Catholicism in this way. Belief is about dogma. Encountering the holy is about receiving communion. Being a good Christian is being about asking, does this count? The does this count part is, of course, I always encounter on Saturday afternoons when I do a wedding at four o'clock and somebody always inevitably comes up and says, does this count? And I would say, I have no idea whether this counts or not. I think I can safely say that the choices made at the Council of Trent, excellent choices for their time and place, now need revisiting, especially in the United States. I think that the Catholic community in the United States, now in a very different time and place than counter-Reformation Europe, needs to balance the mediated authority of hierarchy with an immediate democratic model of first-hand experience. It needs to balance faith as doctrine with faith as an experience and affective event. It needs to balance a community centered on the sacraments with a community centered on personal witness and evangelical outreach. Secondly, a balancing of the sacramental and evangelical impulses within Catholicism would address two major problems within the contemporary institutional church, that is, clericalism and the priest shortage. As, one of, as any of you who have made an Ignatian retreat knows, the majority of spiritual directors at a Jesuit or any Catholic retreat house are not priests. Indeed, I looked this up the other day just to make sure, the majority of spiritual direction, directors in the United States are women. Spiritual direction, campus ministry, and preaching itself rest on very different models of authority than that of clerical ordination. As Emil Durkheim, the founder of the discipline we now call sociology, pointed out over a century ago, over against traditional authority, which is passed on in institutionally defined protocols like ordination, there's charismatic authority, which, is merge, which emerges outside of regular institutional channels an authority which is self-authenticating and not dependent on institutional permissions. One is simply a good preacher, or one is not. One is simply a good spiritual director, or one is not. Ordination has nothing to do with it. As Phil Donnelly, God rest him, who taught me and, uh, at Weston many years ago and gave us our diaconate ordination retreat, told us just days before before our ordinations. Gentlemen, I want to remind you that if one is a dingling before ordination, after ordination you will be an ordained dingling. <laughs> an emphasis on the non-sacramental, non-ordained, charismatic nature of church leadership, available in a more evangelical understanding of Catholicism, would enable the gifts already present in the Catholic community, especially the gifts of non-ordained men and women, to build up the community. Catholic Christianity has always recognized such charismatic authority within the community, traditionally channeling such charisma into religious orders. St. Dominic, St. Francis, and St. Ignatius, all of whom were originally viewed as suspect by the institutional church of their day, eventually achieved canonical approval by channeling their charismatic worldviews into discrete religious orders. Perhaps the time has come, indeed, I would say the time has come quite a ways back for the Catholic community to broaden its institutional appreciation of charismatic authority beyond the confines of religious orders of men and women. Can such a, broad, such a broadening of vision would allow non-ordained Catholics, both men and women, to become a more active part in the evangelization of both culture and of individuals within that culture. An emphasis on the self-authenticating charisma of lay people with obvious gifts in spiritual direction, preaching, and retreats would take some burden, and I think some of the over-expectation that the Catholic community places on a shrinking number of ordained clergy. And I would also say that it would take up the promise of Vatican II in a sustained way, a promise built on the insight that the church is the entire people of God. Thirdly, 
An emphasis on balancing the evangelical and the sacramental within Catholicism would make the Catholic tradition both more accessible and more understandable to both American Catholics and to other Americans as well. As a student of American culture, I believe that the Nike Shoe Corporation has coined the most American phrase in contemporary US culture, and all of you know what that phrase is. Just do it. Just do it has helped to sell millions of Nike sneakers because it plugs into the one of the most basic impulses in our culture, an impulse which celebrates immediacy and democratic access. Very close to the heart of the American character is a belief which everyone has the right, indeed everyone has a duty, to take part in the great exper experiment of being a citizen. Don't wait for others to do it for you. Do it for yourself. This unmediated, highly individualistic, and immediate impulse has been overplayed, of course, in our culture. But its positive elements have helped to make North American culture among the most creative and lively in the history of the West. Do this because I told you so, that is the argument from authority, is now the weakest argument in the arsenal of authority in cultures like the United States. A far better, or at least a far more successful argument is, do this because I can offer you an experience from which you yourself can discover why this is a better option. Children must be told what to do. Adults want to experience the truth and to then make their own decisions. Our culture long ago, politically, socially, and educationally, left behind the argument from authority, which rests on the belief that there are others in a better position than you to know what you should do with your life, or who should be president, or what your children should learn at school. Catholic Christianity in this country, at least the form of it upheld by some bishops, still clings to the argument from authority as the basis for its own authority and identity. This may, this argument from authority regarding its identity may or may not be basic to Catholic Christianity itself. This is a topic for another day and another time. But in terms of its ability to sell Catholicism in the competitive religious market of the United States, I have profound doubts as to its usefulness. Actually, I'm being a tad disingenuous here. I think the argument from authority is a non-starter in evangelizing cultures like the United States. I would argue that such an argument even fails among Catholics themselves. As Peggy Steinfeld, who's a friend of mine, who runs another, or another uh, group at Fordham University, the, the Institute on Religion and Culture, told the Conference of Catholic Bishops a number of years ago who were meeting in Dallas to draw up what became the Charter for the Protection of Children. If you can't offer people an immediate experience, democratically accessible to everyone, ordained or not ordained, as to why Catholic Christianity makes the most sense of the most data available to us, then I think the game is over. And fourthly and finally, an emphasis on the evangelical, non-clerical, and democratic emphases of the Catholic Christian tradition would help in important ecumenical ways in addressing common Christian endeavors in evangelizing the United States. The divisions between Catholics and Protestants at the time of the 16th century Reformation forced both sides of the divide. That is, it forced both Catholics and Protestants into taking theological stances which were unnuanced and polemical. The, the Middle Ages, the Church of the Middle Ages, what we call the unreformed church of the High Middle Ages, in fact, I think, did a much better job in balancing the sacramental and the evangelical, the communal and the personal, the clerical and lay rights than the post-Reformation church of the past four centuries. Lay guilds, lay appointment of certain clerical positions in parishes, the lay friars of the Franciscans and the Dominican orders, all of these gave late medieval Catholicism a much more democratic, pluralistic, and effectively satisfying piety than the post-Reformation Catholic church. Perhaps now is the time, at long last, to recover those pre-Reformation energies. Starting with the great liturgical revolution of the 1930s and 1940s in France and Germany, a, re a revolution which found church-wide expression in Vatican II on, in the great constitution on the liturgy, 
Catholic and Protestant Christians found renewed appreciation for sacramental worship, especially the Eucharist. Vatican II then represented one of those moments when both Catholic and Protestant Christians found renewed energy from the sacramental tradition. So that today, a vast spectrum of Protestants, Anglicans, Lutherans, and even certain groups of reformed Protestants now consider the celebration of the Eucharist the main event on Sunday mornings. To be uncharitably competitive, I think we can say that the recognition of the importance of the Eucharist for the church was a victory for the Catholic side. I now think this would be an, ex an excellent time for US Catholics to return the compliment and learn from those Christian traditions which have been better maintained by Protestant Christianity than Catholics since the Reformation. Traditions that include more democratic approaches to ecclesial oversight and authority, which include non-sacramental celebrations which can be led by any Christian and not just by priests, and a more pluralistic approach to Christian witness and evangelization. I think, that the, I think that Catholics have mined the sacramental communal side of the Christian tradition well. Indeed, I would say we have come very close to overmining that tradition. Quite apart from the practical concerns posed by an increasing shortage of priests, the sense, probably correct, that the contemporary church is not going to permit the ordination of women or of married priests, and the widespread concern, even among the clergy, of a reborn clericalism among seminarians, some of whom at least seem to be out of touch with what the vast majority of lay people want from their clergy. Balancing the sacramental tradition of post-Tridentine Catholicism with a more evangelical, lay-centered, and affectively centered tradition would provide a corrective yin to the yang of a church that I think we can safely say is now in crisis. At the very least, I'd like to have a sustained conversation about that, about that possibility. U.S. Catholicism needs to become more evangelical in the next several decades. That is, it needs to emphasize the importance of personal affective witness to the gospel, as understood by all Christians. U.S. Catholicism needs to balance its reliance on ordained clergy and on the celebration of the Eucharist with a renewed appreciation of the charismatic gifts of lay men and lay women, and a renewed appreciation of non-sacramental forms of worship, like the liturgy of the hours and liturgy focused on witness and preaching. This by itself would address a number of problems facing the U.S. church, like an over-reliance on foreign-born priests and an exponentially, number, an exponentially shrinking number of presbyters. U.S. Catholicism needs to become more accessible. It needs to make itself more accessible to everyone, Catholics and non-Catholics. A direct, first-hand, personal experience of grace and conversion like that offered in Ignatian, Kairos, and other retreats would go some of the way towards starting this. Such an experience would, at long last, enculturate Catholicism into post-war North American culture, while at the same time offering the kind of challenging spirituality that appeals, that appeals to many people. That is, I would propose a schema for US Catholicism which says, be more personal and direct, and don't rely so much on a pool of clergy who sometimes are out of touch with Catholics. Be more experiential and democratic in reaching out to Catholics and others. Offer people an experience of why Catholicism is such a satisfying form of Christianity, and don't rely on bishops' pastorals, which no one reads. Be more cognizant of the gifts of the whole people of God, which is the church. At least that's what the last Universal Council of the Church told us. And I say, let the games begin. Thank you, Thank you Mark. Uh, we will have two respondents uh, from our STM faculty, and then there will be a chance for you to uh, respond and weigh in yourself. But uh, I will uh, uh, introduce them now together, and I'm not sure which goes. Okay, Richard's going to. Uh, I'm going to reintroduce them and then uh, uh, together. Uh, Father Richard Lanann is Professor of Theology in the School of Theology and Ministry at Boston College, my colleague, our colleague. He is a priest of the Diocese of Maitland, Newcastle in Australia, and a past president of the Australian Catholic Theological Association. His principal field of study is ecclesiology, the study of the church, an area in which he has published two books, The Ecclesiology of Karl Rahner 
and risking the church the challenges of Catholic faith. He will be followed uh, in uh, his response by Dr. Hasman Ospino, who teaches in our school Hispanic ministry, theology, and education here at the Boston College. He is also the director of the graduate programs in Hispanic ministry, which is uh, rapidly growing and we're very proud of that. His research and teaching focuses on the dialogue between faith and culture in culturally diverse contexts and this, in how this dialogue shapes Christian education and ministry at various levels in the life of the church. Dr. Espino is the current secretary of the Academy of Catholic Hispanic Theologians in the United States. So first, uh, Richard Lennon. Lennon. Thank you. Mark has offered us an attractive vision of an articulate and engaged church of believers who know their faith and can speak of it, which, dare I say, is what we aim at here as well. Brochures are available as you leave. <laughs> there are, I think, a couple of points that need to be questioned, though, in order that we get some nuance right in order to protect what I think is that fundamental Catholic identity of being able to keep together both and. Catholics know how to walk and chew gum. They value babies and bathwater rather than throwing one or the other out. So this evangelical church I think there are questions both about how you achieve it and what it looks like. Mark emphasised in his paper that as a church, as a Catholic church, we have in our past given an overemphasis, mind to the point almost of exhaustion, the communal, the sacramental and the mediated. And that ultimately that hasn't been helpful, that it's led us too much in one direction. So he appeals for balance, a balance which is more on the individual, the unmediated. I wonder, though, if there isn't a danger that in the long term this would be just as distorting. New distortions, perhaps, but no less distorting, no less inauthentic of the whole, of the both and. So Catholics know, for example, that there's not only faith, but there's the faith. That is, that Christian faith is always more than my conviction no matter how lively and passionate that conviction might be, that I'm always inextricably linked to a community of faith. And that, for me, is the danger in Marx's self-authenticating charism. There's nothing bigger than me. A communal faith, I think, is a challenge to the very American cultural values that Mark identifies, and particularly to the supremacy of individualism. It's not clear to me in the paper how you avoid deifying those values rather than being about a God who's bigger than them and who therefore challenges them. To say that none of us gets to devise the faith nor do we get to make up the church that it is a part of it, isn't to say that everything therefore is imposed on us from above, but it is to recognise that God and not me has both the first and the last word. It's to recognise also that God might speak differently than me, and I'm not talking here about Australian accents. <laughs> So I might be sure that God on a good day wouldn't have wanted the church and especially its structures, but in so doing, I'm running the risk of constructing a God who's the same size as a New England Liberal Democrat. I wonder, though, if, the, to take a, an insight from, from Karl Rahner, that what we need to reclaim is the... the the balance and the tension between the fact that we are both humbled and liberated by believing as members of the church. We're humbled because in the end we have to recognise that we don't have the last word, nor do we get to make it all up, nor do any of us get the church that we'd want. But paradoxically, that's also the liberation because I'm given the gift 
of a witness to faith that's richer, broader, deeper than I would ever achieve in my single lifetime. I'm also given a long history of where we've got it wrong in spectacular ways often, but that too is something from which I can learn. And hence I wondered about the appropriateness of the Nike just do it as some guide for how we are to be church together. Because after all, hasn't the just do it principle led Nike to use child labour in its factories around the world? Hasn't the just do it principle added something to the subprime mortgage overdrive? Hasn't a suspicion of order, of regulation, of community been at least a significant contributor to the current global financial crisis? So if there is the removal of something bigger than myself and my desires, then there's as much risk of dysfunction as there is from over-regulation. I'd hasten to add that the alternative, therefore, is not a passive do it because I told you to do it. The fact that I don't have either the first or the last word doesn't mean that I don't have any word that I can't challenge dominant ways of acting or that there's no place in the church for the prophetic. Our capacity to be prophetic, to keep working together on the sort of church that we are called to be, to be authentic and articulate witnesses to God's kingdom, comes not from baptising Nike's philosophy, but from our own baptism, from our own tradition, from our own theologies that are about a church that is balanced, that recognise this, the importance of the sacramental, no less than it does the importance of authentic personal faith. I wondered, as a third point, if the cultural changes amongst Catholics today that Mark identifies, a church that looks so much different from what it looked like in the 1950s, has not come about simply because of the impact of the dominant culture, but also of Vatican II itself. I thought there was a danger in Mark's paper that the church he was identifying was the church that emerged more from Trent rather than Vatican II, and that therefore there was insufficient acknowledgement of the changes that have come about as a result of Vatican II. Of course, it can be argued, and argued validly, that the 40-plus years since Vatican II haven't brought about the millennium either, so that it's time for another approach, and let's just do it. It's true, of course, that the reception of Vatican II at all levels of the church has been mixed, and remains so. But that's not surprising in the light of the historical perspective of where we've come from on our faith, our failures to be faithful to the challenges to preserve the both and, our failure to hold in tension all the elements that constitute authentic Catholicity. We have, though, I think, in the end, in the Council, a model that promotes the dialogue, the openness, the sense of possibility that Mark uh, endorses and promotes a church that will indeed be more evangelical. Thank you. It is truly exciting to be part of tonight's conversation with my colleague uh, Richard and responding to Mark's uh, stimulating lecture. My first encounter with Mark's work was about 10 years ago when I had just migrated to the United States from South America. I have always been a dedicated reader of matters related to theology and church history. Thus, as a young man, learning his ways in a new culture, once I had a basic command of the English language, dived into some serious reading about Catholicism in the United States. My first two books on American Catholicism were American Catholics by Jesuit historian James Hennessy and Catholics in American Culture by Mark Massa. Mark's work impressed me from the beginning because it masterfully described the experience of Catholicism that had very little to do with the type of Catholicism I had grown into. 
Catholic ghettos with five, sometimes more churches in a 10 block perimeter. A bright journalist who faithful to her revolutionary convictions spent weeks in prison and later became an icon of Catholic life and service. A football game between two university teams, one Catholic and one Protestant, perceived by many as the game of the century and the symbol of a long holy war between Catholics and Protestants. A Catholic bishop who was a media star, a popular priest standing on Boston Common on Sunday afternoons, sharing with curious spectators that extra ecclesia nulla salus, outside the church there is no salvation, and other interesting, interesting stories. After I finished Mark's book, I sighed, put the book on my desk and said, only in America. <laughs> Mark's proposal of an evangelical Catholicism for the United States is unique because the context of such proposal, as described, would, would make sense only in America. Why is so? Mark's three main points in his proposal not only correspond to the particularity of the ecclesial experience of American Catholicism, but also to that of the culture within such experience has come to be preserving the separation between church and state, the polarization between to total culture and evangelical outreach, becoming evangelical as a strategy for Catholicism in the 21st century. I could not be more in sync with that proposal, particularly when in my own research about the development of American Catholicism in the United States, I focus on the conversation between faith and culture and how that conversation affects how we understand our relationship with God, with God and with others in the everyday. In some sense, I read Mark's proposal as an invitation to embody a cultural Catholicism that springs not just from the uncritical mediation of authorities or the simple ascent to doctrine or the mechanic celebration of sacramental rituals, but one that results from the sincere and honest dialogue with, where many voices have a say have a say at the table on the shaping of the Catholic experience in our own context. A Catholicism that results from the validation of every person's experience in the faith community, regardless their gender, race, ethnic background, language, economic condition, political affiliation, migratory status. A Catholicism that affirms the experience of the divine in lo cotidiano, the everyday, and the lives of Catholic women and men searching for meaning. Mark's proposal calls for a more dynamic understanding of, ca of the Catholic experience, building on a concept repeated several times in the lecture, balance. Once again, I could not agree more with Mark in this, in this regard. Nevertheless, when I hear the proposal of a more evangelical Catholicism, as a pastoral theologian and religious educator researching reflecting and teaching about the culturally diverse nature of the Catholic experience in the United States, a number of concerns emerge on my mind that require immediate attention. If they are not seriously considered, there is a risk that the proposal of a more evangelical Catholicism may not take root in all corners of Catholic life in the United States. I will only outline three of such concerns, focusing primarily on a number of experiences among non-Euro-American Catholics in this country, who as a body constitute nearly 60% of all American Catholics, perhaps more. First, the historical transition from total culture to embrace of mainstream on the part of American Catholics seems to me to relate just one side of the story. The transition reflects primarily, though not exclusively, the experience of Euro-American Catholics whose model of Catholic life has reached the level of normative in many, in many ecclesial contexts and idealistic in others. Truth be told, not all Catholic groups in the United States between the end of World War II and the first decade of the 21st century have enjoyed such transition. 
When many of your American Catholics were becoming highly involved in American politics and social life, as well as becoming one of the most economically affluent sectors in society, black Catholics were just beginning to grasp the fullness of what it meant to live in, a, in the era following the years of the civil rights movement in society and in the church. Hispanic Catholics, approximately 5 million in the 1960s, were beginning to experience what theologian Alan Deck calls the second wave and eventually grew nearly 1,000% in five decades. Today, today, Hispanics constitute more than 40% of the whole Catholic population. More than 50% of Catholics under the age of 18 are Hispanic. Asian American and Pacific Islander Catholics have also grown exponentially, though their numbers are much smaller. Together, these groups constitute more than 50% of American Catholics. Most Catholics within this other half of the church have not had a, had a chance to develop a total culture experience in their ghettos and barrios because they live on the margins. They did not enjoy the full benefits of the American Catholic school system that made possible that many Catholics went to college and became professionals. They did not make it as a group into mainstream, and they did not become middle class. For many among us, the daily concern is the struggle to full recognition in the church and society. For millions, the most urgent matter is literally survival. A more evangelical Catholicism, then, must reconcile and bridge the coexistent, marginal, and mainstream Catholicisms that define the present experience in the United States. Second, Marx's four characteristics of an evangelical Catholicism, namely attention to experience, validation of charisma, accessibility, and ecumenical, Ecumenism are nothing else than a call to retrieve the genuine meaning of the original Christian experience. History provides us with glimpses and examples of how this may already be possible. I believe that there is already an existing evangelical Catholicism among us. We can appreciate the power of popular Catholicism among Hispanic and Asian American Catholics. The easiness with which Catholics in the barrios engage in ecumenical dialogue motivated by issues of social justice and politics. The emergence, in, the emergence of charismatic leaders, especially women, often without academic degrees and sometimes without legal documents, that transform communities and never expect to rise to the higher levels in the church's structures. My concern, then, is that because such evangelical Catholicism is expressed in Spanish or Korean or Creole, because it is not led by leaders with terminal degrees, because it is sustained by daily practices that are suspicious to authorities and many mainstream Catholics, because it is too emotional and not enough rational, then it can be ignored or dismissed without appreciating its potential to enrich the complexity of the American Catholic experience. A more evangelical Catholicism, then, must embrace the already existing forms of evangelical Catholicism that already constitute Catholicism in the United States. Finally, carrying on the vision of a more evangelical Catholicism requires resources, leadership, and collaboration. There are sectors in our church that may claim to have all three elements. Others possess only one or two. We need to embrace the idea that it is the whole church that has the responsibility for the whole church. It is of concern that often issues related to Catholic, Hispanic, African-American, Asian-American ministry and theology tend to be reduced to addendums or footnotes or fictional stories. Repeatedly, we hear that these issues simply belong to those who identify with those cultural traditions within the church. A more evangelical Catholicism must affirm the common responsibility that we all share for being part of one body and will foster a sense of authentic collaboration. 
Consequently, we need the full commitment of the hierarchy and the many charismatic leaders from all our communities. We need excellent programs of faith and leadership formation that prepare people to value the role of experience while enjoying the beauty of our tradition. And we need the re revitalization of the sacramental ritual experience, acknowledging also that God's divine, pre divine presence is everywhere and it is not exclusively constrained to such uh, rituals. As Mark clearly highlighted, this must happen in a spirit of utmost balance. If a more evangelical Catholicism is to become a reality during the 21st century, it will happen in the United States. Yet, it cannot occur beyond or without the inclusion of all the various communities that make up the church in this country, and will not fully happen without embracing the stories and the culturally diverse experiences of Catholics living both at the center and at the margins of the church and society. Mark, my friend, if we can pass on this vision, one day we will be able to sigh, put our books on our desks, and say, only in America. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Hotsman and uh, Richard. Uh, I'm going to let Mark come to the uh, podium and uh, answer questions, not only the ones that have been posed by your two respondents, but anybody. So your, uh, the floor is open. Uh, you can make any observations you wish. Right. Questions? Just, I just want to make two points before uh, I hear your more interesting questions. Um, Sir Richard is absolutely right. I believe it a balance. I don't think we can. Re I was asking for a replacement of communal with the other, and also, I think the current management of the church is involved in a direct attack on Vatican II. There's, there, is, there is a movement afoot in Rome to redefine, John O'Malley has written about this book, in his book, to say that nothing important happened at Vatican II. So there is an effort to redefine what happened at Vatican II, to normalize it in a way so that basically we can return to pretty, something pretty much like Tridentine Catholicism with a few extras, but liturgy in English and things like that. I'm really worried about that, and I think that... Um, Okay, that's enough. Uh, secondly, um, I, I, I think that um, Ospian was right that the, what I was talking about is primarily the experience of Anglo Catholics. But my experience at Fordham, where about a quarter of our student body is, is non Anglo, and the vast majority of those are Hispanic Catholics from various um, traditions. Um, my experience is that the concerns of the first generation, the first wave, and to some extent even of the second wave are very much not that of the Anglos. My experience of the students we get is they dress alike, they think alike, they want to look like they stepped out of a gap ad. I mean, my experience is that they would fit in seamlessly with a lot of the stuff. Not completely, you're right, but there's a lot there. That I think there's an overlap there. Anyway, questions? Sure.